Bonjour. So if it's okay, I'll stick with English. Uh, you'll thank me for that. I'm here today uh, to tell you about something very important. As, is, as important as anything that I've talked about in my 35 years of writing books about the digital age. Because once again, the technology genie has been released from the bottle. And this genie is being summoned by an unknown person or persons named Satoshi Nakamoto. And this genie is now at our disposal to give us another kick at the can to rewrite the economic order and the social power grid. Let me explain. By the way, on Twitter, I'm at DTapscott, if you're tweeting away. There are huge changes that are underway in the world, and I think that if we do this right, we can rethink many of our institutions to create a more sustainable, just, and fair world. To begin, there's a technology revolution that's underway. Now, you're familiar with all these technologies, mobility, the social web, the Internet of Things, cloud, drones, robotics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data. I've become convinced that the most important technology taking us forward for the next two to three decades is none of these. And you would be surprised to hear me say it's the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and it's called the blockchain. Blockchain. It's not the most sonorous word in the world. I remember 25 years ago, I would explain the World Wide Web, and it just rolled off your tongue. Today, we have the blockchain. It is what it is. But this technology will enable very profound changes, if we will it. Let me explain. For the past 40 years, and I've been around talking about this stuff for most of that time, we've had the Internet of Information. And it's been great. If I send you some information, I'm actually not sending you the information, I'm sending you a copy. Whether that's a PDF or a Word document or a spreadsheet, or an email, or even with the web. The web was a platform for the presentation and publishing of content. The first era of the internet gave us all a printing press where we could copy information, and that was great. But copying things is not great when it comes to assets. Assets like money or music or art, or all kinds of financial assets like stocks and bonds and swaps and so on. Loyalty points, things like energy, carbon credits. All of these are assets that belong to somebody that may have some kind of commercial value. And you saw with the Internet of Information, we did copy some of these. We copied music. And that pretty much destroyed the lives of many, many musicians. Copying assets is not a good idea. If I give you 100 euros right now, it's really important that you have the money and I no longer have the money. And that I can't give that same 100 euros to you. This is called the double spend problem. And it's been a big problem with cryptographers for a very long time. Now, the basic problem here this is a cartoon from 1993. These two dogs are talking, de chien. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Well, that problem still exists today when it comes to assets. Establishing who a person is 100% and managing all the business and transaction logic of doing commerce is not possible in a peer-to-peer -peer way. So the way that we handle that is through middlemen. We have powerful intermediaries like banks and credit card companies. And we have big technology companies like Apple, 
to manage music. And we have governments to establish our identity and to give us social insurance uh, money and so on. And overall, these big intermediaries do a pretty good job. But there are a bunch of problems that are becoming bigger and bigger all the time. First of all, they're all centralized. And you know any central server can be hacked. And anybody from Home Depot or a customer of Home Depot or Target or an employee of the CIA or anyone who lives south of 49th Street in Manhattan knows what happens when centralized things go down. The Con Ed power grid went down and they were in the dark for 10 days. So centralization is a problem. But also, these middlemen exclude two and a half billion people from the global economy who don't have enough money to have a bank account. They slow things down. You know, it's cheaper and faster to send an anvil by FedEx to China than it is to send money. And they tax things. You know, people who are part of the global diaspora who send remittances home to their ancestral lands may be taxed by Western Union, other companies, 8%, 10%, 14%. The biggest problem is that these powerful intermediaries have captured the most important asset of the digital age, which is data. Data has become a new asset class and it may exceed previous asset classes in value. Agrarian uh, land under the agrarian economy, industrial plant in the industrial age. It's a strange thing. All of us create this data, the greatest asset ever, but it's owned by a tiny handful of companies and intermediaries. So overall, the benefits of the digital age have been asymmetrical. And this is a very hard thing for someone like me to say, because I've been a big champion of the digital revolution for decades. And I argued that the new media is different. Unlike the old media, broadcast, radio, print, and so on, it was centralized, it was one way, it was one to many, controlled by powerful forces, everyone out there was a passive and inert recipient. I said, the new media is distributed. It's decentralized. It's one to one and many to many. It's not controlled by powerful forces as such. It has an awesome neutrality. It can enable us to build a more democratized peer-to-peer -peer world. Well, if you look at the data, that did not happen. The 51st percentile individual or family is declining for the first time ever in history, in modern history. Social inequality has become the biggest public policy issue brought to us by a French radical named Tom Piketty. And we have a big problem. We have wealth creation, but we have declining prosperity. What if there were a distributed platform, a new internet of value that enabled us to exchange and store and protect assets in a peer-to-peer -peer way without powerful intermediaries. That would be an incredible thing. Well, in 2008, right after the crash, the or before the crash, actually, the financial services industry somewhat propitiously a unknown person or persons named Satoshi Nakamoto wrote a paper describing the Bitcoin protocol. And that paper is set off a wildfire that's extended throughout the venture capital community now into financial services, into government, corporations, regulators, academics, and everybody is buzzing about this. Now, don't be confused by the bad press around Bitcoin. See, Bitcoin is many things. In the smallest way, it's an asset, okay? It goes up or down in value. Should you buy it? Should you sell it? Not of interest, unless you're a speculator. More broadly, Bitcoin is a digital currency. It's, it's not a fiat currency created by nation states. It's a cryptocurrency. 
And that's more interesting, especially if you live in Argentina, for example, where there's big currency fluctuation or where there are restrictions on capital flow. And you can't get your money out of the country, for example. It's sure of interest to those diaspora that are paying 12% to send their money back home. But the most important thing is neither of those. The most important thing is the underlying technology of cryptocurrencies. It's called the blockchain. And to me, this is the biggest innovation in computer science in a generation. And it has profound implications for every organization. You see, because trust is established not through powerful intermediaries, but through clever code and through mass collaboration. For the first time, we have a native di digital medium for value. And for the first time in history, people around the world can conduct transactions and do all kinds of things without a powerful intermediary that captures the value. So let me just explain for a second how this works. First of all, if I do a transaction, I send some money, or it could be any transaction. I vote. I... Uh, get married, I sell a house, I trade a stock, it's called the stock market, or that light buys power from a power source and pays for the power. Any transaction goes on to a network, and I'll describe the Bitcoin network here, although there are others, and it's broadcast out to thousands of computers. And then there's a group called miners. This is like gold miners, not young people. <laughs> and they get to work using powerful computing resources to authenticate all of these transactions. And they have big computing power, estimated to be five to 20 times bigger than all of Google. And every 10 minutes, just like a heartbeat of a network, a block gets established. And the first miners to, a, to find the truth, to authenticate these transactions, are paid some of the digital currency of that blockchain, say Bitcoin. And then that block is connected to all of the previous blocks, why it's called a blockchain, and everything is time-stamped. So if I wanted to go and hack that block and pay that 100 euros again to somebody else, I'd have to hack a block using the highest level of encryp encryption, not just on a centralized server, but across thousands and thousands of computers all around the world, ultimately millions and maybe billions of computers, within a very short period of time, in the light of the most powerful computing resource in the world, and not just for that block, but because it's connected to the previous blocks, I'd have to hack the entire chain. Now, I won't say that anything is unhackable, but this is infinitely more secure than the computing systems that we have today. Now, the Bitcoin blockchain is just one of a whole number of blockchains. Who's heard of Ethereum? Hands, please. Okay, this is fantastic. So, Ethereum is a blockchain that has all kinds of extra capabilities on it for application development, for the rapid creation of smart contracts that manage digital assets. And Ethereum, I was uh, uh, speaking at the Ethereum Developers Conference in London. It was a big room like this, about the same number of people, but all along the edge, people were sitting down, six deep, developers. And in that room were people creating an alternative to the stock market, an alternative to Uber, an alternative to our current system of democracy. There were people uh, creating a new model for the uh, banking, for the uh, payment system. It's an extraordinary thing. Now, most people think about blockchains in terms of financial services. And <laughs> to be sure, there are some big opportunities. 
Do you ever hear the expression, a Rube Goldberg machine? If you Google that, Rube Goldberg, it's this guy who created all these complex machines that would do all these things, and at the end, it would crack an egg, or it would shut a door, or something like that. That's the financial services industry. I tap my card on Starbucks, and a bit stream goes through all of these systems, some of them being 1970s mainframes, and at the end, a transaction occurs three days later. Well, banks are now struggling to understand what this technology means. Because what do banks do? Well, in the book, we describe these things. They authenticate and attest to value. They say, this money exists here. They transfer it. They store it. Because they store it, they get to lend it. They get to exchange it. They get to fund and invest value. It's called investment banking. They get to insure value, manage risk, and they get to account for and audit value. Well, that's their role as an intermediary in the financial services industry. If you have a distributed trust protocol, in theory, the banks are not required to do anything. Now, banks are not going to go away, not in my lifetime, but all of the banks are struggling with, what does this mean? At minimum, if they embrace this technology, it could save tens of billions of dollars. It could speed up the metabolism of the whole banking system. Imagine you tap your card in Starbucks, there's no three-day settlement, the settlement is instant, because it's just a change in a database. So, Ben Losky is the CEO of Financial Services for the state of New York. He sued the banks for $15 billion, most powerful financial regulator in the world. He started getting into Bitcoin, and he th discovered the power of this thing. He quit his job, set up his own advisory firm, and in the book, Blockchain Revolution, we quote him as saying, this is Ben Losky, <laughs> In five to ten years, the financial services industry will be unrecognizable. And I want to be part of that change. So everybody's on board now. The Economist did a cover story called The, um, the Trust Machine. The great chain of being sure about things. And they compared blockchains to two other developments. One was the creation of double entry accounting. And the other was the creation of the... Uh, the corporation. Now, they're kind of boring things, but those were the two foundations of our economic system today. And for The Economist, that's how big this is. By the way, you have triple entry accounting. Credit, debit, automatic entry goes into a blockchain. Oops, what do you need an audit for? You have a real-time, time-stamped record of everything that's occurred. Even Dilbert's involved now. I think we should build a blockchain. Uh-oh. Does he understand what he said, or is it something he saw in a trade magazine ad? So Dilbert says, what color do you want your blockchain? And the manager says, I think mauve has the most RAM. So when Dilbert gets involved, you know, something weird is going on. So um, the book has been out for three weeks. Uh, Damn you, Harry Potter. <laughs> it's also in Canada, it's competing with an adult coloring book. Do you know about these things? I didn't even know they existed. Adult coloring books. Best-selling book. Beating the blockchain. Anyway, it's a sign of the times that a book with the word blockchain in the title can compete with Harry Potter. So, that's a technology driver for change. Now let me talk about some of the other big contextual drivers and we'll discuss what might this mean for your business. Secondly, there's a demographic driver. We have the first generation to come of age in the digital age and these are kids. I started studying kids in 1997 when I noticed how my own children were able to use all this sophisticated technology. And at first I thought, my children are geniuses, they're prodigies. 
But then I noticed that all their friends were like them, so that was a bad theory. So I started working with 300 Kids and I wrote this book. A dec decade later, I wrote the sequel. And I came to the conclusion that there's no more powerful force to change every institution than the first generation of digital natives. I'm a digital immigrant. I had to learn the language. This is, globally, it's a huge generation. Not so big in France. Who has children under the age of 33? Hands, please. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, you know, I did that in Italy recently, and about 10 hands went up in a room of 1,000 people, and I was almost canceled my talk. And I was like, you know, everybody, just go home, light a candle, get a bottle of wine, have some music, make some babies. But um, this is a huge generation, biggest generation ever. And what makes them a real force for change is the, the first generation to come of age in the digital age. And um, you see this cartoon? It didn't get a single laugh in the room. This is uh, from 1997 and growing up digital from my book back then. When I put this cartoon on the screen back then, people would fall off their chair. They'd be laughing so hard, you know? Oh, a baby using a computer. That's crazy, man. Now everybody looks at it as like, why doesn't the kid have an iPad or something? What is that weird thing there? Or why doesn't the kid have an iPotty? <laughs> so, this time around, the first generation of the internet, do you remember, you, anyone here remember using Mosaic? And we all had dial-up, right? And it took like a minute for a screen. Now, we've got broadband, we have mobility, we've got all kinds of infrastructure that's applicable to uh, this blockchain revolution, and we have a new generation of digital natives for whom it's like the air. So what does this do to the structure and the nature of the corporation? Well, there was a famous uh, Nobel Prize winning economist named Ronald Coase, and uh, he died just uh, three years ago. And 80 years ago, he wrote a paper where he asked a deceptively simple question. He said, why does the firm exist? He said, if Adam Smith is right, the open market's the best mechanism for allocating people and money and resources in a society, why isn't everybody an independent contractor at every step along the way in production? Why do we have firms? Is Riel Miller in the audience by any chance? Oh, there he is. <laughs> so I got to thank Riel for this because 25 years ago, I said, who's going to be the most important economist to help us understand the internet? And he said, Ronald Coase. And I said, who is Ronald Coase? So I've been talking about Ronald Coase for 25 years. What happened is that throughout the industrial age, the costs of transactions in an open market were greater than the cost of doing things inside the boundary, boundaries of a corporation. So we created vertically integrated firms. Now, Coase talked about four kinds of transaction costs. He talked about the cost of search, of finding all the right information and people and assets in an open market. It would be prohibitive, so we bring them inside the boundaries of the firm, where we have filing cabinets to find information, org charts to find people, and so on. Secondly, the cost of contracting. If every little activity in the economy required a contract, this would be prohibitive, bringing it inside the boundaries of a firm where you don't need contracts. Thirdly, the cost of coordination. Imagine trying to get a whole bunch of people who'd never met together to create an automobile. The coordination cost would be too great, so we bring that inside the boundaries of a firm where we have management. And fourth, the cost of establishing trust in an open market. Prohibitive. Bring it inside the boundaries of a firm. Blockchains will decimate each of these four classes of transaction costs. Search, imagine being able to find the truth. Contracting, 
smart contracts on a blockchain. It's just like what they sound like, contracts that have, have managed digital assets and that have a bank account. Thirdly, the costs of coordination, huge. And fourth, we now have a platform for establishing trust in an open market. So we're moving from an extended enterprise to business webs to something very, very different. Now, I'm just going to tell you a quick story. This is a pre-blockchain story to make the point. This guy on the screen here, his name is Rob McEwen. The reason I know this story is he moved across the street from me. <laughs> He's my neighbor. And he holds a cocktail party to meet the neighbors. And he says, you're Don Tapscott. I've read some of your books. I said, great. What do you do? And he says, well, I used to be a banker, and now I'm a gold miner. He's a funny guy, too. He introduces his wife to the group. And he says, I'm a gold miner. This is my wife. She's a gold digger. <laughs> Thankfully, she is not. And she has a sense of humor. Anyway. He tells this amazing story. He takes over this gold man, mine. His geologist can't tell him where the gold is. So he gives him more money to get more data, millions of dollars. They come back. They can't tell him where to go into production. He gives them more money. This goes on and on. After a few years, he's ready to give up. But he has an epiphany one day. He wonders, if my geologist don't know where the gold is, maybe somebody else does. So he does a radical thing. He takes his geological data, he publishes it, and he holds a contest on the internet called the Gold Corp Challenge. It's basically half a million dollars in prize money for anyone who can tell me, do I have any gold? And if so, where is it? He gets 77 submissions. They come from all around the world. They use techniques that he's never heard of and for his half a million dollars in prize money, my friend Rob McEwen finds $3.4 billion worth of gold. The market value of his company goes from $90 million to $10 billion overnight. And I can tell you, because he's my neighbor, he's a happy camper. What did he do? Well, we think that talent is inside our boundaries, right? Your most precious asset goes out the elevator every night. We have these expressions. No, the uniquely qualified minds to solve Rob McEwen's biggest problems were outside his boundaries. Now, this was pre-blockchain, but Rob McEwen today is hugely into blockchain technology. And he says, just imagine what I could do with this platform compared to what we had before. So in the book, we describe something called a distributed autonomous organization. And we said, how far could this go? The distributed autonomous organization, we said, would have no people. It would just be autonomous agents working on a blockchain with smart contracts. You could have a crowdfunding campaign to create this organization, but it would have no managers, no CEO, and no staff. It would go about its work creating value. So Alex, my son, is my co-author, we thought, should we really put this in the book? I mean, it's a really crazy idea. We said, no, we're going to put it in the book. The day the book came out, an organization was created called the Distributed Autonomous Organization <laughs> with a crowdfunding campaign. It has no CEO, no management, no people. It's a blockchain set of uh, smart agents and smart contracts. And its first job was to go and raise some money. In two weeks, it raised 134 million US dollars, but it has no people. You know that song, Bob Dylan? There's something going on here and you don't know what it is. Get ready for profound changes in the deep structure and architecture of the firm. Changes in how we orchestrate capability 
in society to innovate to great goods and services. So here it is. Complexity from low to high and automation from low to high on the bottom. So the upper left quadrant is your company. This is Renault on a blockchain. The lower left quadrant is smart contracts. And these exist today. Ethereum is a great platform. Autonomous agents in the lower right and distributed autonomous enterprises. 